couple of minutes past 10. Uh, and so I'm going to go ahead and ask uh, Christian if he will open us in prayer. Thank you for the opportunity. And greetings to you all from Washington, D.C. I am Christian Watkins, uh, one of fellow for Faith and Justice with the General Board of Church and Society for this year. Um, if you would, um, please position yourself in prayer. Holy and righteous God, we give you thanks and praise for another day not promised. We give you thanks and praise for the many blessings and, and mercies that you offer us freshly every day. Lord, we thank you for this time of gathering, for this time of information sharing, this time of empowerment and conversation building towards your beloved kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. Empower us today. Move in right away in both this conversation and within our families. Bless every household represented here and even those who could not be in attendance. Lord, move in a mighty way and touch us each in a way that only you know how. And we will continue to give you all the praise and glory for these things we ask and more in Jesus' name. And all those who agree, please say amen. 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 Well, I'm glad y'all are all here. It is, uh, I want to let you know that it is being recorded. And so if uh, you don't want to be recorded, just take your camera off. But it's everybody. Um, we have with us here from Center for Church Development, Liliana Ranhill. She's going to be uh, gathering your, uh, your questions. You can put them in chat. We're also going to reserve a lot of time at the end for, uh, for questions and answers there. Uh, also, working with Center for Church Development now is Tracy Everson. She's kind of shared among the centers, but she's now taking on some greater responsibilities and duties in the Center for Church Development. And uh, so you're going to be hearing uh, from Tracy. And so she's going to be recording this. And uh, Tracy, we'll go ahead and pull up the PowerPoint and we will start our presentation. If you can see that, shake your head yes. All right, money, money, money. Um, so when I was starting at Christ Foundry, uh, I went to a grant writing seminar and I, I remember the, the lady getting on stage and opening her speech with the one who has not, knows not, or asks not. And, uh, it really struck me and as you could tell, here I am, you know, 18 years later and I could still remember her saying that the one who has not, knows not, or asks not, um, uh, and there's a lot of truth in that, those who don't know, um, and, and those that do know, don't ask. And so uh, my goal here is to, now you'll at least know some of the grants and, and then it'll be up to you to ask. Uh, when I started here in the Center for Church Development, you know, I began thinking of when I was at Christ Foundry and I was thinking, what could the conference do for me? I said, it would have been a huge help if the conference could have done online giving for me. I tried to get that going at the very beginning when I started and, uh, and was unsuccessful, uh, partly because it was not in my department. But when COVID hit, the Center for Connectional Resources changed that. And so if a church wants, didn't have access to online giving, then the conference has now set that up for churches. One of the other things that I wish that the conference would have done for me is websites. Well, now we've gotten a connection with that and we're helping churches with websites. And the third thing was helping with grants. Uh, I'd been meaning to do this the last three years and got started on doing that with Tracy Everson uh, this summer. And that is the fruit of this. There was a time at Christ Foundry, we hired a development director, someone who started accessing uh, grants. And to say you hire a grant writer is a misnomer because the, I think the easiest part of getting a grant is writing it. The hardest part is identifying the grant, finding the grant, knowing what aligns with the desires of the granting entity and aligns with the ministry that you're, that you're involved in and connecting that and then presenting it in a way. Um, and having relationships to where your grant will be, you will be considered. And so we'll go to the next slide. Um, and so one of the things I did learn the hard way is I found myself, um, rather than seeking to where the ministry aligns with the granting entity, 
uh, I found myself in a situation at times at Christ Foundry. I was so desperate for money that I was just looking for grants, seeing grants and saying, okay, what can we do to get that money? Uh, and that fell on a couple of uh, areas. One is uh, oftentimes we would not get the grants. Other times we'd get the grants and then be stuck doing a program that we really weren't called to do. Um, Rudy Rasmus shared that with me um, and, and how he started a school because he's like, we can raise all this money around schools and, he, and they were able to launch it, able to get it going. He says, but they weren't able to sustain it. And he said, in hindsight, we were never called to do it. We were just chasing after the money. So just to avoid that, I'm just speaking from uh, my experience. That will be a temptation. And I want to encourage you to avoid that temptation of chasing after the money. Remember, we're not called to serve mammon. And if you're faithful to God, serve the vision that um, God, will, God will provide for you, provide for your ministry. So we'll go into the next slide. So if establishing a not-for-profit corporation, it's not always necessary. There's lots of entities that grant to churches. Um, and, I, and I will add this. More will grant to churches, especially when you have a, a non-church partner. So if you're doing something in the community and you can bring along a partner, uh, you know, we, uh, I remember Christ Foundry getting a grant and we partnered with the Dallas Police Department, with our local police department in doing some prevention program and things with, with, uh, with children and youth. Uh, if you can find another partner, that often helps. If you decide that you need to develop a social service arm of your church, one way to do that is form a not-for-profit corporation with the state, and there's the website there, and we can share this link with you. If perhaps somebody can share that link in the chat, and you can grab it, you can copy it, and so forth. And again, this is being recorded. Once you have an entity formed with the state of Texas, and then you applied to the federal government for an employee identification number. And then there's two routes you can go. You can go and form your own not-for-profit not and go through all of the federal uh, requirements to get that uh, designation. Or the easier way, in the way that we did it through Christ Foundry, was to go through the United Methodist Group ruling. And, they, and if you establish it is a United Methodist ministry, uh, not-for-profit, you can get a ruling under the umbrella of the United Methodist Church for a not-for-profit uh, corporation. The benefit of that is um, it, it enables you to reach out to grants and it, you're, it's not a church applying for it, yet it's a social service that is wholly owned and controlled by a church, but it is another entity. The drawback to that is it's still a religiously affiliated group, and there's uh, most of the most of the granting entities don't prohibit religious affiliated, but most of them prohibit religious activities in their granting. Does that make sense? That distinguishing, but there are those that will not grant to any religiously affiliated entities. And so, whereas it's much easier to do it under the United Methodist umbrella, um, you may fit some restrictions there. But then again, um, we are who we are. You are a church. We're called to do ministries. And if you are forming a not-for-profit, if you say it, and if it's not religiously affiliated, I wonder why you're doing that because we're we're a religious entity. But anyway, uh, I digress. Going to the next slide. So um, we started putting together this list, Tracy and I. We were doing some of what, what I knew from my experience. Uh, we were doing Google, we were searching websites, uh, and our, our goal is basically to start developing a crowdsourced list in the North Texas Conference of Grants. So asking our churches to say, okay, if you come across one, we want to know, we want to add it to our list. If some of them are on our list and you discover there's no way any of our churches will ever get that, don't go for them, it's not good, they're not granting anymore, or they're out of business or whatever, we want to hear that. Or 
you know, if you got a grant, okay, how did you get that grant and so forth. So the idea is this can be a community, uh, community work and us developing this list. And we thought about, okay, should we spend more time on it? Should we do more researching? And, and Tracy and I decided, no, let's just get that list out there because some of these are due September and um, each of you can do your own research on these as we get going and please let us know instead of just us two doing research, you know, we can get more people researching as we go. Uh, Want to also know we're not endorsing any of these. Um, these are just ones we've run across. A lot of these grants have various restrictions. The CCD as an entity may be going for these, some of these same grants and so we, we don't want resentment. If, if you get turned down and we get accepted, I can tell you three years ago, I applied for a grant for a fantastic program in a church that had a program that was not as good as my program got the grant and we didn't. And so I'm sure that church had a different perspective on their program and my program, but from my perspective, my program was better. We didn't get the grant, but the church did. Um, but I, I want to celebrate with them and share that and and remember that we are just one body. We are one body in Christ. And so it's not a competition between the churches and that we're on a, we want to work together and help help support one another and celebrate one another. So um, going from uh, there again, we're not going to apply on your behalf. Next slide. So with this, I'm going to turn it over to Tracy as okay. she's doing our primary research. Uh, Tracy, can you just give me one, one second? Um, oh, and before you jump on, I think we had a couple questions about what you were just talking about earlier. Is it okay for me to just jump on and ask those questions before you get started? Sure. Okay, so um, Catherine was asking, uh, do we do both recruit a partner and use the un- group pooling or one or the other? Um, yeah, either or both. It may depend on what the ministry is and it may depend on what the granting entity is. So for example, if you're going for a TMF grant, there's no need to have a not-for-profit. There's no need necessarily have another, uh, to have another partner because they, they give grants directly to, directly to churches. Uh, on the other hand, if you're going for like a, uh, uh, a communities grant of North Texas, uh, you know, you may be better off having a church, having something separated from the church, and having another entity that is formed that does basically your social services or a specific social service uh, that you're doing. So, okay. And then uh, Denise also asked, "Is this number different from our regular 501c3 nonprofit?" Yeah, and so um, you have your not you have your your church is under that UM group ruling. If you're, um, and that's how your church has its not for profit status. It's under the Nashville group ruling. So what I was talking about is there'll be some grants that you'll have greater access to if you have a subsidiary organization under the ownership and control of your church. So under the so meaning your church names the names the board, the pastor serves on it, or however you want to set up your, your governance structure. But basically the not-for-profit is owned by your church, but its umbrella not-for-profit status falls again also under the umbrella of the United Methodist group ruling. Okay, and then last question, when is it appropriate to form a non-profit? Um, I would say if you're if you can identify those ministries in your church uh, that are distinct from your your overt and direct um, religious activity, that you believe that there'll be granting entities that would support that that would not support it through your through your church, then I would say that would be the appropriate time that you you should explore forming a a not for profit. Okay, and those are all the questions. Thanks. Okay. All right. Tracy. 
Okay, good morning, everybody. Thanks so much for being here as we kind of start to dive into this. Um, when, when Owen and I first started talking about this project, as you can imagine, there are so many granting entities out there that we tried to do our best to kind of break them into categories. So if you uh, knew the focus, maybe you could spend a little bit more time on, on certain entities and certain grant writer or certain grant providers. Um, so I, I just kind of uh, have this slide here. There are, these are some of the big categories that we have. Uh, obviously, we have a number of uh, United Methodist uh, entities that provide grants. There are some that focus on um, education and literacy, music, youth, social justice, and then collection drives. And I'll get into that a little bit more. They are not necessarily going to provide you um, money for like fill out a piece of paper and send it in and we'll give you a grant from that. It's more of a collection drive, but I'll get into that in a minute. So looking at the United Methodist grants, um, there are some that focus uh, on archival research and writing. Um, not sure how many of your churches are passionate about that, but wanted to mention that. Uh, there are several that focus on racial concerns, uh, church and society issues, relief efforts, youth scholarships, website development, which Owen mentioned. Um, we'll get into that in a minute. And then some disability ministries, too, that look pretty interesting. All of those are kind of under the United Methodist umbrella. As far as the education and literacy grants, they really were focusing on um, obviously education and literacy, but primarily adult literacy and then underserved children, low income initiatives and providing actually the, the written materials that somebody might need to have a ministry uh, or a, a, an outreach in that category. Um, then there were there are also a number of faith development grants. These were particularly exciting to me because this checks a number of our boxes as far as you know being a church. Uh, primarily, they're focused on uh, and really passionate about discipleship, leadership development, um, prayer and scripture evangelism efforts, um, and then just religious causes. There are a number of um, grants that are provided by music, uh, music writing grants that um, were really interesting to me for anybody who has a, a music ministry at their church. Um, some of the grant providers are actually going to provide instruments or the funds to get instruments um, or equipment like sound equipment, amps, and all the chords and everything that you would need. Um, and then the, some of them also provide funding to actually develop the music program, any kind of a curriculum or anything along those lines. And then there are also a number of the foundations that we discovered that it's hard to put them in a category because each foundation focuses on about five or six different things. So those you'll want to spend some time really reading uh, the details that we're going to go over in just a second because the the um the areas of focus on these were so wide and broad that was it was even hard to come up with this list for example um one of them was the maps foundation and they um you know they do focus on literacy and under uh underprivileged communities but another interesting thing about them is they actually refurbish basketball courts so if you had a you know a gym that was run down and needed a new basketball court um the maps foundation is is something you'd want to look at which i thought was really interesting but here's a few of the things that those um and so I was kind of looking through, it was, it was these, you know, children, youth and families, social services, a lot in the medical and health realm. Um, if there's, you know, your church is involved in a, you know, a vaccination clinic or anything along those lines, some of those might be really interesting to look at. And then there was a category that uh, I just deemed miscellaneous because it didn't really go with anything else. Um, they weren't really literacy or education or anything like that. But there's there's one grant uh, uh, provider that focuses on 
providing support for those uh, that have Alzheimer's, you know, Alzheimer's initiatives, which I thought was really interesting having uh you know been through that myself with a member of my family you know i know that 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 you need a lot of support in that um in that season of your life uh there were some that provide social and environmental justice which i thought was unique and didn't really fit in any of the other categories some that focus on skilled workers rather than um you know just giving money for college students but providing support for skilled workers. And then also this one didn't really fit under anything else. And that's the North Texas Giving Day, I'm sure. Uh, for those of you in the North Texas area, you've probably heard this mentioned um, on the news specifically just about um, how it's, it's one day, uh, I believe it's a Tuesday, um, actually, now that I say that, I'm not sure about that, uh, but it is September 17th and it's going to be um, a day when the idea of giving to a nonprofit organization is going to be high on everybody's radar. A lot of organizations participate in this. It's something that you can register for. Um, Owen will speak more to this in a minute, but um, I know in my past line of work, this was a big day. Uh, there might be some restrictions as for churches, but if you had a food pantry or something along those lines or something that might be more of a social service, this might be worth looking into. Okay, so I mentioned this earlier, the collection drives. These are not necessarily anything that you fill out paperwork and apply for to get money. These are to collect things. Um, there's, uh, I found one that uh, they, you, you basically do a collection of toner and in inkjet cartridges, collect all those, and then you contact the organization and tell them what you have. They send you a, you know, self, self-addressed stamped envelope or whatever, and you mail the toner cartridges into them. And then in a certain amount of time, they'll send you a check. Uh, same thing with the shoe drive. We've actually, our churches, um, two of the churches that we've served have done a shoe drive before. I will say it is probably a better idea if you have an associate or an adult volunteer that can really spearhead this. This is probably not something you want your the senior pastor to focus on. Uh, and you need to have an inordinate amount of room because gently worn shoes do start to smell after a while. And I say that from experience. There's also another collection drive that collects old cell phones, same kind of concept. Uh, you gather them up, you, they send you something to send them all in, and then they'll write you a check. As far as the shoe drive is concerned, I know that, um, like I said, we, we have done this twice, and um, I think each time we got about $600. So it might be a good way for a youth group or something like that to just raise a little bit of money. Okay, so we're going to look at the list um, of grants right now. I apologize because it is a little bit on the small side. I'm going to blow it up as much as I can. Um, we're going to uh, email everybody who registered for this the, a copy of the PDF, but I also want to show you where it is on our website. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen not right now just to be able to go back to our website and share our website with you. So this is the home page of the uh, ntcumc.org. And if you click here under COVID-19 resources, this bright red banner across the top, you're going to scroll down just a bit. Here we see grants. And at the top here where it says new, this is going to be uh, the grants that we're going to be looking at. So I'm going to try to make this larger so you can see. Hopefully everybody can read that. So we, pro again, the categories are at the top here, as you can see United Methodist grants at the top. And then down the side, you'll see that we've included the name of the provider and then a little bit about them, what they're focusing on, the amount of the grant, the due date, and when the selections are made, including a URL where you can go and find more information. So I'm going to just scroll through this quickly just so you can see. Um, I have included text in red. As you can see here, this just says one grant per jurisdiction. If there's anything like a 
something that you're going to need to know. Um, if there's a geographic restriction, if it's a focus only on the United States, if it's um, you know, something that's outside of the United States. There are some that are uh, just specific counties. Um, there are a couple that are specific to Dallas County. Um, there are, there's also one that's specific to Fannin County, which we've already sent um, Jan and Vic the information on that one since their territory includes Fannin County. And then I'm just scrolling through. And again, here's one that says around the world in the state of Texas. So in case you were sharing this outside of, um, you know, with other pastors outside of our conference, they would know that some of these are going to be specific to either to, to North Texas or to certain counties in the state. So we tried to highlight that as best we can. As we just sort through, here's a list of counties that you know, they only provide in. Okay. Uh, I did want to mention, um, as we're just continuing to scroll through this, there are two that we found that I wanted to include on the list just because I think at some point they're going to do something again. I know COVID has wrecked a lot of us, but it really has done a lot to those who are providing funds, as you can imagine. So there are some that right now we, we identified but they're like, look, we're not, we're not doing anything right now at all. So we put them on the list, but we did mention that they are currently on hold. So I'm back up at the top uh, now under the United Methodist Grants. Oh, and I believe there were a couple that you wanted to highlight. Yeah, I wanted to point out that the, the, the racial, ethnic, uh, local church concerns, that is one that I received at Christ Foundry. That is one that a, uh, a number of our churches have received. Uh, um, this is new that it's one per jurisdiction. And so uh, that is um, um, I, I, money from the general church is going to be declining, has been declining. Uh, but that is one it's coming up uh, and for some of our churches uh, to consider. The Texas Methodist Foundation, that is one that's been very generous, continues to be generous, funds a lot of ministries in the North Texas Conference and around uh, Texas and New Mexico. And so their letter of intent is December 1 for their spring cycle grant. And so you can go on their grants page and it lines out, you know, you start out with a letter of intent and then they invite you or don't invite you to apply. One of a follow-up that, that we could explore doing if there is interest is, is bringing the vice president for grants here to share with what they're looking for, what they are interested in. And so our churches can become more aware of what resources are available for them because they are one of the more generous grants to churches in the North Texas Conference or other granting entities and are the other that I thought about uh, inviting in the future is someone for the Center for Not-for-Profit Management to be able to share um, um, more tips on doing grant research, it, researching and grant writing. Uh, the third one I was gonna mention, and perhaps uh, I, I saw Mike Bogman on here and he might be able to share. Uh, when I was at Christ Foundry, we did apply and we were a part of the North Texas Giving Day I think I read somewhere along the way in the last couple of years, North Texas Giving Day has restricted some of the, as much as the religious organizations that can apply. I think when they first started, any church that wanted to be a part of the North Texas Giving Day could be a part of the North Texas Giving Day. Um, 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 does anyone know, you can put in the chat link, if they have gotten stricter on what churches can uh, apply or not. And I will also share that um, the, the, the good of the North Texas Giving Day is it does spur people often to give that might not give, uh, but you also pay more in credit card fees than you do in the bonus you get. And so um, there was a time when we were- Daddy, I'm on break, son. Okay, I'm glad you're on break, son, from your kindergarten, first day of kindergarten. Um, I, there was a time at Christ Foundry, I was encouraging church members to give their tithe on North Texas Giving Day because we were getting a bonus. Well, that bonus has now declined to such that uh, 
we lose more in credit card fees than we get than you would get in the bonus on North Texas Giving Day. But it is something that is worth considering. So those were the three that I wanted to lift up. So I'll turn it back over to you, Tracy. Okay. Alrighty. Michael, did you have something to share with that about North Texas? Um, Michael, can you yeah, I would, I would just offer that they, they actually made a point effort about a year ago to intentionally include and expand the reach of religious organizations that can participate in North Texas Giving Day. So um, it shouldn't be a challenge so long as you can establish your 501c3 status, um, even if it's just under the umbrella ruling of the United Methodist Church. And, uh, yeah, the, the bonus funds are close to the credit card fees, but not all the way. Um, I'm happy to talk about the advantages and disadvantages of it. It's been a huge thing for us over time. Um, it's particular to our donor base that makes it, I think, particularly successful. Um, but I'm always happy to chat about it with folks or um, help with strategy on some of the things that have made it successful. Does anybody have a question for, for Michael with about North Texas Giving Day right now? Uh, hearing none, here's what the Center for Church Development is offering you. Five things. One, continue to provide and improve this list of granting opportunities. Two, send out periodic emails on grants and uh, like when they're coming available or what we're learning and then due dates that may be up. Uh, number three, if there, I, as I mentioned, having Texas Methodist Foundation or another organization provide a Zoom call or even get a, um, um, I think, um, um, a, getting a professional grant writer or someone to come in here and to share what they're doing or get Kathy Sweeney. I know she is, she is being certified in, the, in this type of work, maybe getting her to help us out on how to present grants and how to seek out grants. And actually, Kathy, I'm gonna call on you in a minute to kind of share what you've been learning through your work at SMU. And then the uh, fourth is, if you want us to review your applications, uh, Tracy's time is limited, but we want to try to help and do that. And so if you got an application that you want, hey, ask Tracy, hey, can you look over this? Um, she, um, she is offering that at this time. Again, we're gonna see how much um, that affects how much we are able to do that, but that's something we want to do. And then the fifth thing, I found it really hard as a uh, local pastor trying to get the district superintendents and the bishop's signature and, and, uh, and chasing them down. So something I, we can do is if you email it to our office, um, well, we office with the bishop so we can get the bishop's signature and um, hopefully help you get your district superintendent signature for you. So that's the, that's the fifth thing that, I, those are the five things that we feel that, that we can offer at this, at this time to help and support you. And so with that, um, I'm gonna ask Kathy, if she'll share a little bit about what she's learning and then we'll, we'll come to, to questions and then wrap things up. Kathy? Hey guys, uh, I'm really glad to see all this, um, all this great work. Thank you, Owen, it's, it's fabulous. And it does show a lot of um, the intentionality that needs to go through with, with grant. Uh, I'll, I'll break it into two, two different areas, grant finding and grant writing. You mentioned that at the beginning that um, it's an equally skilled set. And so what, what I did um, when, when I was um, assistant executive director at Agape, I, I enrolled in a grant certification course that covered both of these things. I'm still in the process of finishing that up, but should be done in the next month. Um, and that's offered through SMU. And what I've, uh, what I've learned about the writing process is that um, obviously there are professional writers, but there are, um, um, for lack of a better term, jargon or understood uh, um, objectives of each of the sections of a grant if they're more complicated. And so um, the, the question being, um, when do you need to hire a grant writer? Um, I think when you start getting into um, 
some some very detailed um, show me what your plan is show me what your long-term budget is how is this sustainable what kind of data are you going to give us the more reportable stuff over time instead of I'm, I'm, I'm applying for a grant for a thousand dollars to help support our XYZ and they, they provide the grant because of how you've pitched them up front, but there's not a whole lot of uh, follow up after that. Um, and I can talk much more in more to it, but um, I do think that having someone, oh, and you mentioned someone from TMF um, coming in and talking about what they're looking for in the grants and even um, maybe maybe having something that goes through a grant proposal process um, and how you know like the cycle of a grant so that people know what they're what they're what they're moving towards the timing of um, applying and and the expectation of when answers will or or acceptances will will come back all of that is information that's important um, but very grant specific. So that's what's going on on my side. Thanks, Kathy. We may call on you in the future and if- uh, Happy uh, to do it. I know, and I'll, I'll say this as well. I, I know uh, uh, Kathy is getting her certification in this. And if, if you're looking to hire somebody, uh, uh, you can explore that with her, so. Uh, we'll share that with you. And, and uh, what questions do we, um, well, I'll finish this out. If you do get a grant, the main thing is just um, the last thing there, don't run it for the rest of us. <laughs> follow up with your grant, do what you say you're gonna do, do what they ask you to do, follow up, do the reports, uh, and, and be faithful for what they're, they're providing and uh, again, let us enter in this with the, being mindful that we have a generous God who provides for our churches, provides for our ministry and provides for us. And, um, and you know, they, and, I, and, and I'll go ahead and share this. When we first made the list and I had a little personal confession time, mm -hmm. uh, there was a couple of them that I didn't put on the list because I said the Center for Church Developments, we're gonna go after that grant for that. And then I thought, Owen, Shame on you. This is not what the Lord is calling you to do. Uh, uh, you need to be faithful, be generous, and the Lord will provide for you as well. And so I repented of that. And, I, and so we put them all on the list and, and put them out there uh, and seeking to work just uh, open transparency. So with that spirit, we're going to let's help one another develop this list and develop this resource and, uh, and to help, our, um, to help one another uh, in this process. So with this, um, um, y'all have our contact information, uh, Ross at NTCUMC or Tracy. Um, if y'all can give a virtual round of applause to Tracy for her research and her work on all that she did on this, that has been a great blessing. And so with that, Liliana, um, what questions do we have? And uh, we can turn off the screen sharing. Um, I think we only had one question <clears throat> that was uh, a little done a little bit earlier. And that was about, it was for Tracy about cartridges. Um, I believe they were, I'm looking for it right now. Uh, for the old cell phones, does that company include other electronics like second generation Apple TV and or printers? That's a great question. Um, I remember seeing a note on there about um, phones and possibly tablets and maybe computers. I don't remember seeing anything about TVs on it, um, but if you go to the website that's on that document, I'm sure they'll give you more information. I don't recall seeing anything about bigger electronics, although that would be fantastic. Okay, and then um, I believe that is it. Yeah, I saw one about, Denise was asking about um, about property, and I do remember seeing some of those. I don't know if it was the mustard seed one, but there are some on there that are building related and property related, and that'll be listed on the description of it. Do you remember offhand, Tracy, which one those might be? I think it was the mustard seed. Um, I know that there were a couple. Let me see if I can scroll back to that section. Samantha, can you share more? 
Sure. So we applied for a grant through the conference. Um, I can't remember the name of it, but we are putting in a community garden. One of the requests and recommendations was to uh, look for further financing from other entities in order to uh, increase longevity and sustainability. And so um, Andrew gave us the NRCS uh, opportunity and I looked into it and wrote it up and began the procedure. And the challenge with federal grants, <laughs> it's possible, it's doable, but if I had known all this at the get-go before starting, I would have, we would have gotten the grant and it would not have been an issue. But to apply and receive funding from the government, you have to have what is called a cage number. And it's a number assigned to any entity doing business with the federal government. Even though we're not doing business, we're receiving money, which is doing business. <laughs> to get a cage number, you have to have a dunce number. A dunce number, D-U-N-S, is assigned by this, um, this corporation. Anybody can apply for a dunce number as long as you have certain um, required materials showing that you are um, who you are. This is where specificity is incredibly important. When we applied for the dense number, they took our name down as First United Methodist Church. There are thousands of First United Methodist Churches. Even though we wrote the First United Methodist Church of Jacksboro, Texas in the dense application, they shortened it. So we had to go through this layer of trying to figure that out. Um, then, you have to have supporting evidence from the state that you are not for profit in the state that you are in. And so we had to go to the state and get information from the Department of State certifying that we were um, in good standing with the state to be non, not profit, tax exempt, okay? Um, the challenge there was we were incorporated so long ago and uh, who knew about the specificity that the federal government will require later, the agent of representative for the church was the, is the administrative assistant, but her address somehow got listed as the office address for our church. So that had to get fixed. Now, between all of the fixing, basically, and the bouncing back and forth, and the thing is, is that when you interact with, it's called the SAM system, you have three days to accomplish the changes that they require, or you're out, you're kicked out of the system and you have to go back to the beginning and start all over again. Maddening. So I got kicked out, it was at least four different times because of all of these requirements that don't come up at the beginning only after you reach a certain point do you realize, oh my goodness, that is coming. So I missed this grant. I had received an acceptance letter saying, oh yeah, you got the grant, good job. And then I got a phone call saying, oh, sorry, you got kicked out of the system because of your CAGE application process and you won't get the grant. Terrible. So just letting you know, this is hard, but I would be happy to help anybody who wanted to do this so that you don't have to go through the H-E double hockey six that we did for the last three and a half months. Um, I know what to do the next time. And if I get the guts up again to, to hit this mix master of, of detailed craziness, then I will do it. But I don't want anyone to have to suffer the way we did. Um, in dealing with the, with the government in that way. So just a cautionary tale for all of you who might choose to pursue the NRCS or any federal grant. Yeah, and we didn't have any federal grants on our list for that reason. Also, some of them that I was running across talked about how they would not allow basically a church to be a church. You couldn't talk about faith, you couldn't talk about you basically could not be a church. You could not evangelize or talk about Christ or any of those things. So again, back to Ellen's point, as we started, you know, don't try to be something that you're not. Um, that was the reason. And Ellen, about your construction question, 
Um, it's the Maybe Foundation, M-A-B-E-E. -E. It's under various, um, let's see. It's under various areas of focus, uh, the second one down on our list. And that's the one that I think somebody was mentioning earlier. All right. Well, I'm seeing some interest about, about, about all this. Um, I, I had a volunteer pro bono lawyer that helped Christ Foundry through all our formation and all this work that we did. And so it sounds like this may be good and we can have, you know, Kathy back, have Samantha back, um, some others who have navigated this. Um, and, you know, perhaps Mike Bottom, we could share a little bit about how doing, uh, what kind of structure you need if you're going to do some for-profit activity as well. And so I can see this being a very helpful Zoom uh, for churches in the future. So um, thank y'all. God bless you. It's good to see all of you.